All right. Hi, everyone. Okay, we'll just, I see the waves. All right, we'll give another minute for people to sign in. Okay, I'm going to mute everybody. Um, please sign into the attendance. It should be on your eye clicker. Okay. Give it one more minute and I'll start. we have just about everyone. Okay, um, we'll put you all on mute. All right. Welcome back. Um, uh, not how we all anticipated our spring break to go, but I think we will, uh, we will make do. Um, let me make a few points at the outset, because um, I know a lot of students are talking about things, and I want to make sure that uh, I do as best as I can to keep you guys apprised of what's going on. Um, things are very much in flux. Um, we don't quite know what to do because we've not had this before. Uh, for example, in 2017, we had Hurricane Harvey, um, which shut the school down for about two weeks. And there were a certain number of students who lost their homes and were in shelters. And we uh, made accommodations to help those students. But fortunately, it only affected a small sliver of our population. Uh, a couple years later, we had the Super Bowl which basically shut down downtown for two weeks. Um, some professors canceled class, others didn't. I didn't, the shocker, right? Um, but we managed it. Um, this is different. We are all scattered to the corners of the earth. Uh, I see all of your lovely faces on my uh, screen. Um, but we have to learn in a very novel fashion. So let me make a few general points for you also. Um, first, I'm going to try as best as possible to make sure you learn what you have to learn. Um, regardless of what the school does with grading, you still have to know this stuff. You'll have the bar in a couple of years. Um, you have to know it. Second, I wouldn't get too hung up on the grading issue. I know there's issues on whether you go pass fail. Um, let me make a general point. If you treat this class like a pass fail, you are in trouble. Um, if your only objective is to try and do the bare minimum, you might fall below the curve. Um, pass fail is not a panacea, right? Pass fail doesn't mean you get to just slack off. Uh, if that's where we're going, you're still gonna have to do a lot of hard work. Um, before the break, we talked about, um, uh, uh, we talked about going over practice midterms. Um, I'm still available. Um, I'd like to do office hours. Um, in fact, I want to hear what you think about this, the best way to do office hours. If you have a thought, you can raise your hand and, and tell me. Uh, but I want to find a way that I can make this as personable as possible. Um, we can do it a couple different ways. One, I can just call you on the phone. If you prefer that, That that's fine. I'm allowed to do that. Uh, we can do it by uh, a group, whereas people can just come to a specific point. Or it can be private rooms. Um, if you have any preference for office hours, uh, tell me. Uh, and I'd be happy to accommodate um, uh, whatever you guys think is most useful. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about uh, uh, concerns more generally is learning now. Um, we have a lot of distractions going on in our lives. Um, I think I told you I have a 15 month old daughter who God willing is taking a nap right now. Uh, uh, someone else is watching her, uh, but no, we have a lot of distractions at home. So at least for the next 90 minutes, try to keep things as um, focused as possible. Um, a couple of you asked me about the attentiveness feature in Zoom. I don't like it. I am not going to check it. Um, so let me explain what this is. Um, Zoom has a way of knowing what you're looking at. Are you looking at me or are you looking at some other screen? Right? In theory, at least, if you're watching Netflix while this video is going, you're in trouble. Uh, but some of you take notes. You type notes. You use Microsoft Word. You use some other app to take notes. I'm asking you to go to iClicker. I'm asking you to do things in other windows. So I will not check that feature. I promise you, I won't even look at it. I don't care what you're doing. It doesn't matter. Um, 
I think the school might end up disabling it. I don't know. That'd be my recommendation. But again, some things are beyond my control. So uh, don't worry about that. Um, I do want you to take attendance. The eye clicker is on. So if you haven't signed in, please do it. We have three people absent. These are best, best attendance state ever. Uh, so this is actually pretty good, all things considered. Um, do you have any questions? Anyone want to raise their hand? If you click the little raise hand button, you'll jump to the top of the queue. Anyone with a question? And I appreciate that most of you put your last name first, not all of you, but most of you, uh, so I can easily sort you uh, by last name. I see no questions. You're all liars. I know you have questions. Uh, but but that, that's okay. If you want to uh, talk to me later and ask things privately, that's fine. I, I, don't, I don't want to put anyone onto the spot. All right. Um, so the way I want to do recitation is similar to how I did it last time. We're going to start alphabetically and go down the roster. So if you are Alexander, Alan, you know you're on deck. If you're Bassin, you know Bennett's on deck. Um, this is going to make it easier. Uh, if it helps you, uh, you can unmute your microphone when I'm about to call on you. That way there's not much of a delay. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So let's try to summarize. I'll do the poll question in a minute. But let's try and do summary. Um, Let's try this one. Who's up next? I know I told someone you're up next. I don't remember. If you can raise your hand, I will start with that person's name. Is that Madison? Madison, is that you? I can't hear you. You have to take yourself off mute, please. Still up? I think you might still be on mute. Nope, can't hear you. Um, if you <clears throat> maybe untry plugging your headset for a bit, see if that, that, that matters. How about now? Oh. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. All right, so Madison, I want to just refresh our memory and everyone should be able to see Madison. What I'm going to try to do is when I call on someone, uh, spotlight their videos to come to the front. Um, we talked about three different kinds of co-tenancies before the break. Can you remind us, please, what is a tenancy in common? Okay. Um, okay. So a tenancy in common is um, basically that separate but undivided interest. Um, and we talked about well, Madison, let me ask you a question, right? Let's say you have A and B and they're tenants in common. Okay. And let's say A dies. What happens? Um, if it dies, their heirs get the separate but undivided interest. Right. So let's just use the names I said. So we have A and B are tenants in common. A dies. What happens to A's share? So, so it would go to B. That. No, you said it right the first time. Oh. With a tenancy. Oh, go to A pairs? Don't be so uncertain. You're right. With a tenancy in common, right? With a tenancy in common, when A dies, A's interest goes to B. Okay? Everyone with me. I'm sorry, it goes, goes to A's heirs. Okay? All right, that's Madison. Okay, who's up next? Mackenzie, you here? Okay, where are you, Mackenzie? Okay. All right, Mackenzie, remind us, please, what is a joint tenancy? Um, a joint tenancy is when the two people have an equal undivided shares and they do have the right of survivorship. Okay, what is this right of survivorship? So when, say, A and B are the uh, joint tenants, and B dies, then A gets B's interest. So then they have a fee simple. Okay, that's exactly right. And I have some workers outside who just decided to turn in a chainsaw. I'm not happy about it, but we're, we're stuck, so we have to go with it. So if you hear a chainsaw in the background, it's not a slasher film, uh, it's Josh's house. Um, uh, so th that's exactly right. 
with a joint tenancy, with a joint tenancy, you have A and B, and they have what's called a right of survivorship. When A dies, B gets A's interest, right? It does not go to the heirs. All right, so Mackenzie's next. Okay, next up is, uh, uh, I've got him. I'll get better at this. Uh, Samantha, can you hear Samantha? I can. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much. Okay, so now just remind us, Samantha, what are the requirements to create a joint tenancy? What do you have to establish? Um, so you have to have four you factors, what they're called unities. That's right. And you have to have time, title, and interest, and possession. Okay, what does that mean, those four unities? Well, what does it actually like, entail? Um, so time, they both have to acquire Blackacre at the same time. Good. Um, title, they have to get Blackacre from the same instrument or document. Good. Um, interest, they have to have the same equal and undivided share. And then possession, they both have to be able to like access the land. Perfect, perfect, right? T-T-I-P, okay? T-T-I-P, time, title, interest, and possession. And these are the requirements to establish a joint tenancy. What happens, uh, uh, Joan, I think you're up next. Are you there? Yeah, hi. Oh, uh, Alexa, that's right. You don't, you, you put your, I'm using the roster. I know that's not, not your real name. Okay. Okay, do you have your camera on or no? Uh, yeah, I should. Okay, I'm not seeing you, but I'll, I'll call on you anyway. Oh, there you go. Okay, thank you. What happens if you have a joint tenancy and A sells his interest in Blackacre. Um, With a joint tenancy and A sells his interest in Blackacre. You can't, you can't sell it without the permission of the other. With, with a joint tenancy? Yes. That's not right. Oh no, once the joint tenancy is destroyed, it creates a tenancy in common. Ah, uh -huh. so let me ask the question again. With you have A and B, joint tenancy, a sells his interest. What happens to the, to the tenancy? Um, it becomes a tenancy in common. That's exactly right. Th thank you, Alexa. Um, when you have when you have a joint tenancy, and one party sells his interest, that severs the joint tenancy, and you go back down to a tenancy in common. Um, Ashley, you here? Yeah. Okay, there you are. So Ashley, let me ask you a question. With a, te with a joint tenancy, can one person convey the interest to himself as a means to destroy the unities? Yes, I guess is in the case that we discussed a couple weeks ago when she sold it to herself to try to sever. Do you remember what state that case came from? Oh, California. And was California following a common law rule or a modern rule? Modern. Ah, so let me ask the question again. Can a person convey an interest himself to sever a joint tenancy? You're shaking your head no. Is that the only answer? What am I asking you? You said in California you can't, but you can do it elsewhere. What am I trying to get at? Like severing like their survivorship rights? No, 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 I have a simpler question. You can do it in some states and not in others, right? What do we call that? How, how do we explain that sort of dynamic? Um, like this, a straw man? No, 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 no. You're, you're, you're overthinking this, right? What's the common law rule? That, let's see. Can you use, can you convey an interest yourself at common law? You could, you could, I guess I have it wrong mixed up then, because I thought you couldn't at all. Ah, I should try this again. The California court, do they say you can or you can't convey it to yourself? They allow, okay, so they allowed it for California then. Okay, so what's the common law rule then? California, in common law, they didn't. Yes, that's exact, thank you, exactly, okay. <laughs> at common law, 
right? At common law, a person could not sever a joint tenancy by conveying it to themselves at common law. But under the modern approach, in California at least, you can sever a joint tenancy in that fashion. Okay? Come with me. Any questions? Put your hand up if you do. All right. All right, Monique, you're up next. Okay. Okay. All right, Monique, let me ask you a question then. What is a tenancy by the entirety? Um, it's, a, it's created only in husband and wife, so it's the four unities of the joint tenancy plus marriage. That's exactly right. Um, a tenancy by the entirety is similar to a joint tenancy but it has a fifth unity, which is marriage. Now, Monique, let me ask you a follow-up question. Can one husband in a marriage sever a unity? Is it possible for a husband to sever the unity by himself? Uh, no. Why not? Uh, I think you need both, uh, like consent from both parties. Ah, so let's take a look at this poll question, right? I'm going to, um, I'm just going to paste into the chat. I was giving you some thought of the weekend. I frankly hate the screen share feature. I think it's terrible because it screws up your entire window. So I'm going to put the question in the chat and um, I'll just ask you to look at it, Monique, right? So here's the question. Husband and wife own Black Acres tents by the entirety. The husband, that's H, executes the following conveyance. Black Acre from H to A and his heirs. Is this conveyance valid, Monique? No. Okay, tell me why. Um, because uh, it didn't say husband and wife. Yes, yes, exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think you said it well. When you have a tenancy by the entirety, both spouses have to turn the key at the same time, right? They both have to consent to the transaction. So Adam, let me ask, Adam, you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Adam, let me ask you a question. Thank you, Monique. Um, let me ask you a question. If you have a husband and wife that own land as tents by the entirety, are they stuck on Black Acre forever? Uh, they're only gonna be stuck there unless, or they won't be if both of them agree to obviously yes. the land. Right, so there's a couple ways of ending a tenancy by the entirety. So Adam, what's the first way? Um, that both um, agreed to convey the land. That's right. If both the husband and the wife agree, right, both the husband and the wife agree, there's no problem. They can sell Black Acre. But Adam, if they don't agree, what are the other ways of ending the tenancy by the entirety? Wouldn't it be by divorce? By divorce. That's right. Right? If one spouse divorces the other, then you dissolve the tenancy by the entirety. And depending what state you're in, don't, don't, this is not as important, but it either becomes a joint tenancy or perhaps a tenancy in common. All right, Adam, one last question. What's the final way that a tenancy by the entirety can, can dissolve? Perhaps the most natural way. The natural way, um, I'm assuming death. Death, yeah, yeah, very morbid topic for this time of year, right? Thank yes. you, Adam, right? Death, right? If you have a tenancy by the entirety, and say the husband dies, then the wife has survivorship rights and she inherits Black Acre and Fee Simple, right? So you're able with a tenancy by the entirety to convey things, but you have to do it with joint consent. Okay, have you with me so far? All right, that's all old. Uh, I haven't mentioned anything new yet. Could, you know, get you back thinking from spring break. Um, we're moving on to a new topic today called marital property. Um, you will take another class in law school called marital property. This is a very important topic for any lawyer to know. Why? Many of you will get married. Many of you will get divorced. It's numbers. Um, and you have friends who get divorced. It's a very common thing that happens. Okay? As a general matter, marital property only matters when people get divorced when they die. Uh, during the marriage, these sorts of things don't really have much significance. But when there's a death or a divorce, it matters, All right? Let me 
walk you through some history to understand this. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Over time, two primary systems of marital property evolved. The first is what's called the English system, also known as common law. And the second is what's known as the continental system, which is known as community property. Um, why is the second one known as a continental system? It referred to the continent of Europe. That is Spain, France, Italy, right? The actual continent of Europe. Whereas England is not on the continent, so sort of island off to the side, okay? Um, the first system, the English law system, is the most popular one in the American Republic today. Most states have common law approaches. And it worked like this. Um, at common law, husband and wife were allowed to have separate property. Okay, they were allowed to have separate property, which might sound wonderful. Um, but also at common law, the husband owned almost all the property, if not all the property, and he could manage it. So even though the wife, in theory, could have property, she wouldn't have had it. The community property system is a little bit different. Um, the husband and wife, when they were married, would effectively form a partnership. And this creates a separate legal entity, what's called a separate person. Uh, it's a fiction, right? There's no third party created, but you actually basically create a third party. And whatever one spouse owns, the other one owns as community. They share the assets equally. Now, that might sound really fair, but at historical times, the husband still managed all the community property, so the wife was still left out by herself. Um, today, eight states have community property. Arizona, California, Idaho, Louisiana, Nevada, New Mexico, Washington, and Texas. Yes, you have the weird one. Um, and this creates certain challenges for you. Uh, you have to learn stuff people don't in other states, but it actually gives you an advantage. Why? Uh, if people move from, let's say, New York to Texas and they're married, guess what? They need to deal with the rules that apply here. So you have an advantage over people in the other 42 states, you'll learn something new. Um, unfortunately, the Uniform Bar Exam doesn't really teach Texas-specific law. It doesn't. Um, you need to know it anyway. Chance asks, do we, do we need to know which states are in each group? Um, I'd like you to know the eight states in the common law category. Those would be helpful, although I can be honest with you. If I ask you an exam question, it will almost be California or Texas for community property. Those are the two I would ask you about because uh, they have specific wrinkles. Uh, but at least you should know the eight that, that are community property. And I will almost always use New York because that's where I come from. Not in New York this week, but uh, here, in, here in Texas. All right, we will start today with common law and we'll finish with community property uh, uh, in the next few classes. Um, they're very different rules and you need to keep them separate. Um, on the exam, if I say you're in a community property state like Texas, make sure you apply the Texas rules. Um, now, someone asked Josh, what are the tenancy by the entirety? It's complicated. The tenancy by the entirety operates differently in a community property state and in a common law state. They're different. They, they have completely different rules. Um, so unfortunately, you need to memorize how each one works. Um, but that should be straightforward enough. Okay. Any questions before I drill down first into common law marriage or com the common law property rules? Any questions? All right, Doug, uh, based on the case we read, if there is a tenancy by the entirety is a clause in the will conveying a portion of black acre to husband to a third party valid? Okay, let me, let me see if I can summarize this question a little bit. With a tenancy by the entirety, there are limits on what one spouse can do. So the answer to Doug's question depends how a state interprets its Married Property Act. So the short answer to Doug is, we'll get there later, I promise. Um, any other questions, either by chat or by raising your hand? 
I know students don't like raising their hands. I know it's an uncomfortable thing. Hopefully people get a little more used to it, but I, I'm cognizant that it's not a natural thing that people want to do. Okay. All right. Let's start with common law property. And I want to talk about the fiction. Okay. What is the fiction? Um, in law, we have this concept of a legal fiction where it's something that's not real, but we pretend it's real to make things work. Um, the classic example is a corporation, right? A corporation is a entity, but it's not a person, right? It doesn't breathe. It doesn't have lungs. Doesn't, I don't think it can get Corona, right? It's, it's not, it's not a real person, right? Uh, too, too soon. Um, but corporations have rights. I'm not just talking free speech. They can go to court, they can sue, they can be sued, they can own property. Corporations have rights. So we basically pretend a corporation is a person so that it has some of the attributes of people. We have a similar fiction in this class, which is called coverture, right? Coverture. It's spelled C-O-V-E-R-T-U-R-E. Coverture, and I put it in the, in the text. Coverture literally means to cover, right? Think of an umbrella. And the notion was that when a husband and wife got married, the separate entities dissolved, right? And they basically formed this third person, this entity. And any property the husband has and any property the wife has are put under this cover. And the husband and wife considered a single union. Basically, think of it like a merger, right? You have a corporation. You have Corporation A and Corporation B. They merge. And any property is owned jointly by those by that single corporation. Okay? Now, that might sound, you know, very fair. Oh, wow, that sounds awesome, Josh, right? Well, the husband was effectively the CEO of that corporation, and the wife had no meaningful role. Um, the husband could manage the property. He could sell it. He could put mortgages on the property. He could convey it. And the wife had no say in what happened to that property. Um, what did the wife get? The book describes it, the benefit of the husband's support and protection. All right, whatever, right? Um, but this truly was like a corporation. And let me give you an example. You probably remember in torts that if you have a corporation and an agent commits a tort, the corporation is liable. Remember the respondeat superior doctrine? Does that sound vaguely familiar from last year when we weren't all sitting in front of our cameras, right? It worked the same way. If a wife committed a tort, the husband was actually liable. You have to think of the wife of Kamala as basically an agent of the husband, and she acts the husband's direction. And anything the wife acquires during the marriage will become part of the husband's, right? So truly in every regard, it was like a corporation. The, the husband was a CEO and the wife was an employee and she was bound by whatever the husband decided. Right, this is this fiction known as coverture. Okay? Everyone with me, questions so far? I'll make sure to pause so I can scroll through my 49 people at a time window to see who's looking at me. Okay. And by the way, I'm not joking. In my email, someone actually brought their phone to the bathroom and forgot their thing was on. Not at our school, but at another school. And that got on social media. Please, please don't, don't do it. Uh, you know, I'm just going to assume I'm being recorded now. I mean, hell, I have like five cameras on me right now, right? Um, but I'm... I don't want you to wind up on, on Twitter or YouTube with this sort of stuff, okay? Okay, thank you. Please, please don't do it. All right. Um, one of the perhaps positives, or maybe negatives, depending on how you consider it, but when you have this sort of coverture arrangement, the husband could put a mortgage on his property, right? The wife had no say. So let's say the husband has a gambling debt and he owes a lot of money for gambling and the, his bookie, right? The creditor comes along and says, Hey, you didn't pay your debt. I want to take your property to satisfy your gambling debt. 
Let's see who's next. Uh, Presley, I think you're next. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, is it oh, Natalie next? Yes. So, Natalie, let's use, let's use the example I just gave you, right? The husband has a big gambling debt. He accumulated the debt by himself. The wife didn't even know about it. And then the bookie shows up and says, ha, huh, I want to seize your property to satisfy my debt. At coverture, can the wife stop that that foreclosure? At coverture, no. Why not? Um, because um, the husband, once the husband and wife got married, um, the separate entities dissolved and they became a third person. And could the wife in any way object to the husband assuming this debt? Uh, no, I don't think so. Right, and, and let me just follow up with more question, Natalie. When the bookie was taking, you know, these bets, do you think he cared whether the uh, guy was married or not? Would it have mattered to him? Um, probably not. Yeah, because as long as the husband consents, they can go after any marital property. Okay, thank right. you, Natalie, for that. Appreciate that. Um, uh, next up, Amir, you here? Amir, going once. Going twice. Poor, poor Presley. Presley, you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, thank you so much. So Presley, you could imagine that people didn't like this sort of regime where creditors could just come out and take property that was, that was marital. So what might be one way that you could limit the ability of husbands to get themselves in trouble? What might be something you could do to prevent that from happening? Um... Maybe uh, get the woman involved because uh, if the wife had some say, then it would limit what the man could do. That's exactly right. Now, let me ask you, Presley. Do you think that all these debtor husbands were like feminists and were like motivated by a desire to empower women and give them equality in society? Probably not. No. What do you think was motivating them? Um... Honestly, I'm not sure. Probably just so people don't go into too much debt. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So we have this law that came around the 1830s. They, they, they sprung up in a number of states. I think Mississippi, Mississippi, my goodness. Mississippi, sorry, I think it was Mississippi. Mississippi was first. Texas came out a year or two later. Called the Married Women's Property Act. Right? The Married Women's Property Act of 19, I'm sorry, 1839. Why 1839? Well, 1837, there was this panic. There was an economic panic, right? Nothing changes. Uh, where a lot of people went into debt. And family assets were seized to satisfy those debts. So all these husbands who took out mortgages and loans and these other things were losing their households. And the wife had no say. But then in 39, we get this Married Women's Property Act. Uh, uh, Paul, are you, are you here? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm here. Okay, Paul. Uh, Grayson. It says Grayson on there. Okay, that's right. Thank you. So, Paul, let me ask this question. What was the Married Women's Property Act? What did this law accomplish? Um, it gave women, like, legal autonomy uh, by letting them have, like, a say as far as the property. It's, like, their own property. Could they sell it themselves? Um, I don't think so. Could they manage the property? Uh, not usually. They're still like kind of like the, the home person. So, so, so what, uh, what, what what could they do? What did the Married Women's Property Act actually change? What actually did it do? Uh, it protected the women's property from like the husband's uh, like debts. Uh, how? This is, how? How did it protect the husband's... Uh, uh, how did it protect the, the homestead? Um... I'm, I'm not sure exactly how. Okay. Uh, Jay, you here? Yeah. All right. Jay, how did it... How did the Married Women's Property Act protect the homestead? What exactly did it change? Hold on. Jay, you here? I'm sorry. I think you're not... You may not be here. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, who's next? Chris, you here? Yes, sir. You can't hear me? Is that Jay? Oh, there you are. No, you weren't talking I before. I you a great answer. I promise. Oh, well, you want to give it one more time? Yeah, uh, go, 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 go for it, Jay. I'm sorry. 
Uh, okay, I got it now, I think. What uh, exactly did... Yeah. What changed was the husband before could uh, convey lease mortgage or other can, can come to the property without consent and no longer can they do that. So it protects yes. the property. Right? right. What this law says is in order to convey the property, both the husband and the wife have to agree. Right? They both have to agree. Now, Jay, let me ask you a follow-up question. As a practical matter, if the husband wants to sell the land, would the wife veto it? The wife could not veto it. Well, no, as a practical matter, do you think the husband? Hey, puppy. Do you think? Do you think the husband? Do you think if the husband says I want to sell Blackacre, the wife would actually veto it? I don't think she could, because it has to be a cons- it has to be consensual. No, I know it has to be, but do you think the- if the husband says I want to sell it, do you think the wife will just go along with it? I mean, that's a really context specific situation. <laughs> um, you, 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 I, I doubt. It. I yeah, doubt. yeah, you're right. Uh, but let, let's just be in the year two thousand. Put aside the year two thousand twenty. Go back to the year eighteen thirty nine. As a practical matter, if the husband wants to sell it, the wife would not veto it. But where would this matter? Uh, now we go on to Chris. Chris, you here? Yes, it would matter in situations in which the. Uh, a property homestead was in jeopardy, or the homestead property was in jeopardy by, say, the husband's creditors. Yes. And then there would be a situation in which the wife would be uh, either compelled by her husband or um, in her desire to protect the homestead, say no. Right. And that would create a shelter from the assets being seized by creditors. Perfect answer. Exactly right. The only time the Marriage Property Act actually mattered was in cases of creditors and debtors, right? So imagine the husband took out a loan that the wife did not co-sign, or the husband uh, uh, had a gambling debt, or the husband got into a, a, an accident and injured someone, and there was a tort damage, right? This is actually the subject of our case today from Hawaii, right? Where the husband unilaterally accrues some sort of debt and then a creditor tries to seize the property. The married woman's property act says, no, you cannot do that. You cannot do that because you can only convey pro- your interest if both spouses consent. So this sounds like this lovely concept to give women property rights, but in reality, it shielded debtor husbands. I think Presley said that a few minutes ago, I think she's exactly right. This law just shielded husbands who engage in debt, right? So as a consequence, right, as a consequence, if you are a bank, uh, uh, Naveen, you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so Naveen, let me ask you a question, please. If you are a bank and a married, Mm -hmm. and a husband walks into your bank and says, I want a mortgage, what do you say? Um, Do you have permission from your wife? Yes, not just permission. What do you need? Do you consent? Consent. What does a wife actually have to do? Not just give oral consent. Uh, a written signature, probably. Yeah. So any sort of mortgage, right? Any sort of um, a loan that's secured by the property has to be signed by both the husband and the wife, right? If the, both the husband and the wife sign it, and they fail to pay off the mortgage. Then they can then they can uh, seize the land in a foreclosure sale. If only the husband does it, it's problematic. Uh, who's next? Uh, Sarah. And the husband gets into a gambling debt, and you know the bank wants to foreclose in the house. Is the bank required to get the wife's signature whenever there's a, a bet being placed? I'm sorry, can you say that again? My, it's cutting out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. Let me ask the question one more time. Yeah, I, think, I think it's actually on my end. Uh, the internet unstable message just popped up. Um, the entire world is now on Zoom right now. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me try it one more time. If you have a gambling debt, right? Do you think the, the bookie um, would ask for the wife's permission whenever a, 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 a bet was being placed? Um, no. No. If you have, if you have a, um, uh, let me ask you a question, another question, Sarah. If you have a, a tort, let's just use the example we have uh, uh, from class today, where you hit someone in the car, right? Did anyone ask if your spouse c- 
consent to that tort beforehand? No. Of course not. So the married woman, sorry, the, the Married Woman Property Act, I think makes the most sense when you have a debt in terms of a mortgage. But when you have another type of a debt, like a gambling debt or a, uh, a tort award, like a car accident case, it doesn't quite line up very well. So there's some problems with it. Okay. Any questions in general about the Married Women's Property Act? We'll get to the Hawaii case in a few minutes. I'll give another few seconds if anyone wants to ask a question. All right, let me give you a little bit of history too to make this class a little bit more salient. Um, Texas in 1840 enacted a property act for women. At the time, Texas was still a republic. And it was the most expansive legislation um, in the South. It actually allowed women to enter into contracts, write a will, and super divorce. Um, she could veto the sale of property and also veto the sale of the homestead, even if she was not the owner. Uh, this was actually quite revolutionary uh, because historically women could not enter into contracts or even uh, write a will or have a, a loss of her divorce. So that would be the husband who initiates all those matters. Um, also, I encourage you, if you ever want to read up on the women's suffrage movement, which uh, was very instrumental in the passage of these property acts. Um, in, 18, uh, uh, in the 1840s, you had what was called the Seneca Falls Convention, uh, where a group of women met in upstate New York in Seneca Falls, and they prepared a Declaration of Sentiments. It was modeled after the Declaration of Independence, but basically listed grievances that women had with men. Um, and several of them concerned marriage. How when a woman was married, she couldn't earn wages, she couldn't petition for divorce. So property was a very important aspect of this debate. Uh, one last point. We are now in the year 2020. This year is the 100th anniversary of the, of the, I'm sorry, of the 19th Amendment. Uh, the 100th anniversary of suffered the right to vote on uh, the U.S. Constitution for women. So the 100th anniversary, uh, happy anniversary of women. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, uh, Bryce, I think you're up next. And everyone turn to page 429 in your books, please. Here, Bryce? Yes, sir. Okay, Bryce, you want to read me the problem on page 429, please? After having a stroke, H, anxious to avoid getting into a nursing home or being cared for by professional nurses, entered into an agreement with W. H promised W that if W personally cared for him at home for the rest of his life, H would devise her certain property by will. In compliance with this agreement, W personally cared for H at his home until his death. When he died, H devised the property he promised to W to his daughter by a prior marriage. Can W enforce the contract? All right. So this is this this one always gives people difficulty, right? So so Bryce, let me ask you a question at the outset. Do you remember from contracts the, the idea that there's some contracts that go against public policy? Remember that idea? Yes. What just just refresh your memory. What 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 does that doctrine mean? The public policy doctrine. Uh, so a lot of they didn't want you to be able to uh, promise people things in exchange for you know marriage and stuff like that because it's a little uh, shady. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Bryce, I mean, could, could, could a person say, um, let's sign a contract. If you marry me, I'll give you a million dollars. Would that contract be enforceable? No. Right. Could, could, could you sue for breach of contract and get specific performance if a person backs out of marriage? <laughs> Excuse me. No, you do not. No, that's exactly right. And um, it, it even works with divorce. In other words, you can't basically say, I'll pay you a million dollars to get divorced. Right. That would not be an enforceable contract for a lot of reasons. Right. So, Bryce. Let me come back to you. What do you think the court did in this case? Do you think that the court enforced this contract? I don't think so, no, sir. Well, tell me why. Uh, because it's kind of like, it kind of goes against that pu same public policy. <clears throat> and also, uh, the daughter to a prior marriage would have uh, the interest of the wife of the prior marriage, assuming that she died. Uh huh. Okay, very so, good. Yeah, very, very yeah. good. Yeah, thank you. So, so Bryce is correct. The court here declined to enforce the marriage. And you may think that's a good result, but just 
think about this for a minute. Um, the court says that the husband and wife have an obligation to support each other. And the wife is obligated to care for her husband. And you can't be compensated for doing what you have a legal duty to do anyway. Right? In other words, if you have a legal duty to take care of your husband, you can't be compensated for doing so. And the court says to enforce the contract would degrade the wife and make her a servant in her home. And this is antithetical to the institution of marriage. Right? There was a dissent. Clayton, what do you think the dissent said here? If you had to guess. Clayton, you here? Oh, don't see him. Okay. Yancy, you here? I'm here. Yancy, what do you think the um, the dissent would say in this case? If you had to guess, how, what's the other position here about why this contract maybe should be enforced? Because she gave something up in exchange for taking care of him. Oh. Yancy, what might the wife have done instead of taking care of the husband? What maybe what was another option for her? She could have left him or she could have just put him in a nursing home. Yeah, she'd stick him in a nursing home, right? Where, you know, everyone's quarantined now. Just stick him in a home. But that, that's basically what the, the dissent said. Um, the wife can choose to pay for the care or she can work and and, and then hire a nanny or a nanny. Uh, hire, hire a nurse or someone else to take care of the husband, right? The dissent says we should have freedom of contract. So this is like one of those questions where... Um, yeah, thank you, Nancy. Where, where, where people sort of like say, yeah, of course the husband should take care of the wife. And it's like, wait a minute, that's kind of that's kind of odd that now the husband has a legally, I'm sorry, the wife has an obligation, a legal obligation to um, support the other. Um, if you ever want to test, your, I see Clay said we couldn't hear him. I'll call you in a second, Clay. If you go, uh, uh, if you click preferences within Zoom, there's an option to test your microphone and you can actually see the levels as you speak. Uh, you can do this now or later, uh, but this is a good way of checking if your mic's working beforehand. Okay. I'll come back to Clay in a minute. Well, hopefully maybe we'll get his thing working. Okay. So any questions on that problem in 429? There was both the majority and the dissent. No? Okay. All right. Um, Clay, let's go back to you, my friend. Uh, can you give us, please, the facts in Sawada versus Endo? Hopefully, if you're able to put yourself off mute. No? I'm on the... Okay. Oh, yeah. I, think, I think now we're in business. All right. All right, I'm Clay. Names, and I'm th sorry. That that's fine. Do the best you can. The Sawadas were injured in a car accident with Koichi Endo. Uh, when the accident occurred, Endo was the owner of land as a tenant by the entirety with his wife. Uh huh. Uh, before the trial on the accident, uh, before the trial on the accident was held, Endo had deeded their land to their sons. Good. Uh, subsequently, the Sawanas were awarded uh, each award a monetary judgment against Indo for his role in the accident. Uh, in trying to obtain satisfaction from the judgment, the Sawadas brought suit seeking to set aside the Indo's transfer of land to their sons. Uh, and the trial court ruled against the Sawadas and Sawada appeal. Okay, all right, very good. So, uh, uh, very good. Oops, sorry, man. Very, very good, Clay. Let me ask you a question. What does fraudulent conveyance mean? Just what does that term mean? Fraudulent conveyance. Uh, trying to convey something with the intention of like basically keeping it from somebody else. Like fraudulent being the key term. Yeah. Very good. All right. Thanks, Clay. So let me give you an example, right? Um, let's say that you're an attorney and you're about to make partner, right? Or let's say you're an attorney and you're about to acquire some huge piece of property but you know you're getting divorced and you know that anything in the divorce will be chopped up in half. So you deliberately sell that property to someone else for a brief period of time, get divorced and then have it sold back to you at the same price. In other words, 
you give away property to prevent it from being given away. You can't do that. In, in fact, you know, you're going to laugh now, but this is very common. Uh, very often lawyers get divorced right before they make partner. That way they don't have to share the partnership assets in the divorce. I know you're smiling. Look, I, I promise you, there are eight of you right here. Five of you, you'll, you'll know this will happen perhaps to you or a friend. It, it, this happens. It's very common, right? Because a partnership asset is actually a property asset, which is divided in half. And even though the wife's not a lawyer, you pay her the, or the husband's not a lawyer, you pay him the equivalent to wherever half is. Okay. Um, but this occurs in other contexts, right? What happened here is that the, uh, 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 the tortfeasors, right? The tortfeasors in this case got into a car accident. The endos. And the endos did not have car insurance. They had one asset. Their only asset was Blackacre, their homestead. And they realized that if they go to a trial and they get a judgment against them, they'll lose their home. So they said, aha, I have an idea. Let's sell our home to our sons. That way it's not ours anymore. We'll still live there. And we will use it as our own, but that way it can't be sold, I'm sorry, it can't be uh, uh, seized by the court to satisfy the car accident judgment, the tort judgment. All right. Now, um, uh, Marissa, you here? Yes. Okay, Marissa, did the husband and the wife jointly convey Blackacre to the sons? Yes, before she died. Right. So the husband and wife both jointly conveyed it. So you're allowed to do that. But what is the issue here, right? Why might this conveyance, Marissa, be fraudulent? What specifically might make it fraudulent? Um, the fact that they only gave it to their sons in order to not give it to the people who were suing them. Right, to the, to the plaintiffs. But let me ask you one more question, Marissa. Um, did the wife engage in fraud here or did the husband engage in fraud? Which, which one would have engaged in fraud? That's a harder question. I want to say both of them because they had to do it jointly. Well, who was driving the car? The husband. Did the wife commit a tort? No. No. Did the wife have any judgment against her? No. No. Uh, no. So is there any problem with the wife conveying her interest to her sons? No. No. Okay, thank you, Marissa. Now everyone sees the issue, right? The, the wife didn't do anything wrong here, right? Because she had no judgment against her. The only person who maybe screwed up was the husband. But then this raises the issue. Right? Who actually owns Blackacre? Right? Who actually has the ownership of Blackacre? And this question requires the court to consider the Married Women's Property Act. Right? Now, uh, who's next? Uh, Allison here? Robert? Yeah. I kind of moved behind you. I don't know what list. No, you're... Allison Roberts. Allison Roberts. I'm yeah. sorry, two Allisons. Are you here? Yes. I see Allison Heiner on, on the thing. It's my name changed, but you may have an old role. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I I I I think we had the same one last week. I do it. This role's yeah from January. I'm sorry. Okay, so Allison, I'll call okay. you. Whoever you are, I'll just call on you. That'll be you. <laughs> um, Allison, at common law under coverture, right? Under coverture. How would this case have been resolved before 1839? How would you resolve this case? Uh, the wife couldn't have conveyed it, so the husband would have. And if the husband conveyed it by himself, would that have been fraudulent? Yes. Yeah, exactly right. This is an easy case at common law under coverture. The husband's the sole dominion. If he decides to convey it, it's fraudulent. But what makes this complicated is you have to consider the wife's interest as well, right? Because at common law, the husband was responsible for his own torts and the wife didn't really matter. But now, should the wife be responsible for the husband's torts, right? In other words, should the wife lose her homestead because her husband was a, was a crappy driver, right? You know, that's, that's basically the issue, right? Why should the wife lose and be subject to this, this sort of um, 
a judgment. All right. All right. So, uh, 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 Kelsey, I think you're up next. Yes, I'm here. Okay. I think, are you on phone? No, I'm on headphones. Okay. I hear you. Okay. It's, okay. There you are. Loud and clear. Okay. So the court explains that there are these four groups of states, right, that have tried to figure out how the Married Women's Property Act, the MWPA, should apply, right, in times of, uh, in, in modern times. So, Kelsey, what's the first group? They call it group number one. Yeah, so group number one um, includes Massachusetts, Michigan, and North Carolina. Um, and it basically is, the book says it's essentially the common law tenancy by the entirety, so it's unaffected by the Married Women's Property Act. Okay, very good. So the first group, which I think is what, it was like three states, um, basically says nothing changed, right? The Married Women's Property Act didn't change anything, and the husband's still the, 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 the king of the castle, so to speak. Um, that is not the rule anywhere. Even those three states have abandoned it. Uh, that's in the notes afterwards. So, so uh, don't worry about group number one. It just it, it doesn't even have any salience anymore. All right. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, Marcos, you're next. Yes, sir. All right, Marcos, tell me about group number two, please. Um, group number two is uh, consists of Alaska, Arkansas, New Jersey, New York, and Oregon. And, uh, and, and by the way, let me just pause you. What does New Jersey always do? I mentioned this in class, I think, a couple times. What, 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 when you have a case in New Jersey, what's, what's going to happen here? Um, it, it's case one of mine at the moment. All right, I'll, I'll tell you. New Jersey courts always take the most radical position, right? They always take the most the position furthest from the common law. That's just that's the short answer. California and New Jersey, Jersey is usually worse. All right, Marcos, again. So tell me about group number two, please. Um, the interest of the individual interest of each spouse may be sold or levied upon for a separate debts compared to others. Right. So, Marcos, let me ask you a question, right? How did we define the, the tenancy by the entirety at the outset of class? What was like the defining feature of the tenancy by the entirety? Were there separate interests? No, they are the both spouses are together in one interest. Well, what about in the New Jersey approach, number two? Do are there separate interests? I think you just said it a minute ago. I think you're right. Uh, yeah, it says that they can be levied or sold uh, individually for their separate debts. Wait a minute. I thought with intensity by the entirety, you can't have each spouse selling their interest separately. Isn't that the, the very basic definition of intensity by the entirety? It's also subject to the spouse's contingent right of survivorship. Okay. So, um, Marcus, let me ask you one more question. In New Jersey, is there a difference? between a tenancy by the entirety and a joint tenancy? Is there any difference? Um, I want to say no, but your statement that they take the extreme. You're right. There's none. There's no difference. What the New Jersey approach did, my friend, is it basically converted the tenancy by the entirety to a joint tenancy. You still have survivorship. As the husband dies, the wife gets black acre. But there are separate interests that can be conveyed separately, right? It's basically you have interests that are separate. So the husband can put a mortgage on his interest, but not on the wife's. The husband can take a debtor, you know, a gambling debt on his interest, but not the wife's. The husband can um, have a tort damage and the creditor can... Uh, attach it, but but not the wife's. So basically, there's not much of a difference between the joint tenancy and the tenancy by the entirety of common law. They're very similar, right? Um, creditors, like a bank, can, can seize one spouse's interest. They're separate. Okay. Does that make sense? Any question number two? I think the easiest way to understand number two is New Jersey basically converts tenancy by the entirety to joint tenancy. 
there's really not much special about being married. There's some wrinkles that are not particularly important, but they're very similar. Yes, Nancy, I see your hands up. Thank you so much for, for raising your hand. Yes. Okay, so then if this case had fallen under this second um, type, yep. then they could have forced the sale of the property and then taken yes. whatever damages the plaintiffs had been awarded out of the husband's portion. That's exactly right, Nancy, yes. Had... Hawaii adopted category number two, right? Had Hawaii adopted category number two, then there would have been separate interests. Therefore, the tortfeasor engaged in fraud, right? He conveyed his interest, he was allowed to do this, to avoid a debt. And therefore, the court could have set aside the husband's conveyance of the son and used it to satisfy the tort damage. Right? So that's precisely why this Hawaii case did not follow number two. The Hawaii case followed number three, which we'll get to in a minute. But in New Jersey, the tort fees would have been screwed. He would have lost. Okay. Now, a couple of questions. Um, Elias says, does that mean that a creditor spots at 50% of the property value? It's hard to quantify an exact number, Elias, but basically, yes. Um, uh, what's his face? The uh, the tort feasors could have basically taken up to half the value of the property. I'm sorry, the the, the, the plaintiffs in the tort case. Mike asked, would this be the majority? Well, they list the number of states. You can count them, right? So I don't I don't know the the majority, but this is usually New Jersey's not the majority. Okay. Oh, uh, not s stops stops fifty percent. Okay, yes, I see that. I kept scrolling down. Okay. Will the court have to force the sale? Chance asks. Yes, that's right. Uh, the court will basically have to set aside the sale. Um, and, and the way this works is a court basically pretends Blackacre was never sold to the sons. The sons have nothing. And that way the husband and wife still have Blackacre. And indeed, because the wife died, right, the husband would have fee simple through survivorship and the plaintiffs could seize all Blackacre. That's how it would actually operate in jurisdiction number two, right? You say we the, the, the conveyance of the sons never happened. The husband now is black acre and fee simple. And guess what? The plaintiffs in the, in the, in the car accident case now get the entire thing. Okay. That would be the answer in jurisdiction number two. All right. All right. Questions on... Jurisdiction number two, the second grouping of states, which I think if my math is right is, hold on, let me count. Uh, Alaska, Arkansas, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, that's five. So I think this is probably the minority view, just, just, just counting states. All right, any other questions on that before we go into number three? All right, oh, uh, Chance, is your hand up? Yeah, I, I lost you. I'm, it makes sense with the whole... Uh, you know, stop the sale to the sons, but how would the plaintiff get fee simple of the no 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 wives? no 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 the plaintiffs wouldn't get fee simple, but they could sue the husband for the value of their damage. A husband has fee simple. Assuming the wife died before Well at this point she was already dead. Right? Okay. I don't okay, yeah. Okay. I mean at, at, at this point the wife was dead and the husband had survivorship, so the husband had fee simple. And, they, and, and the, um, uh, and what do you call it? The, 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 the plaintiffs could sue for whatever the value of the property was. Okay, that's fine, gotcha. Now, are you looking up? Is your camera much higher than your, than, than your, than your screen? So I'm actually in my roommate's room. Okay. Uh, that's, that's their master bedroom in the picture. So I have their TV hooked up to my laptop uh, right here. So I think. Ah, uh, got it, got it, got it. That's okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. Anyone else with a question on group number two? All right. Uh, Kinsey here. Or, or no, did I do Victor? Uh, Vi oh, yeah. Okay, Victor. Sorry, sorry, Kinsey. You're 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 kindly on deck. You have a, a brief reprieve. Uh, Victor, explain to me group number three. 
Yeah, so this would be, I guess, with the number of states, the majority rule. Um, it's the case, it's the the rule that the the Hawaii court decided to follow, which is uh, an attempted conveyance by either spouse is wholly void, and the estate may not be subjected to the separate debts of one spouse only. Okay, very good. Um, group number three, I think, is the what you might call the majority approach. Uh, in, in terms of, of the states that accepted, I think it's Delaware, uh, D.C., uh, Florida, Indiana, Maryland, Missouri, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, Virginia, and Wyoming. Um, and what this this model says is a conveyance by either spouse is void, right? And a state cannot be subject to separate debts of one spouse only. So if one husband has the gambling debt, Victor... Can the uh, casino go after the um, um, uh, homestead property? No. No, that's exactly right. So, Victor, one more question: How is this different than the eighteen, you know, eighteen thirties? Are aren't we just back where we were, you know, in the eighteen thirties? Is there any difference? Um, I would say it's pretty similar, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But the difference is that the woman has. Actual voice now, or at that time as well, I guess it was like the 70s. Yeah, 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 thank you. So I think the criticism of group number three is it maintains a sort of, um, not coverture, but but the sort of feeling from the 1830s where the wife still has no independent role, right? Uh, The wife doesn't have an independent role at all. Uh, The wife basically can only go along with the husband. And the husband accumulates a debt, the house is immune. Uh, what if the wife accumulates a debt, right? We keep saying the husband's the gambler. You know, maybe Kenny Rogers is the only gambler, right? What if the wife is a gambler also? And 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 and, and the you know, Kenny Rogers is probably five view, right? Um, maybe Houston people know. Rest in peace. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes. Oh, I'm getting. Do you ever actually go to a Kenny Rogers Roasters? Do you ever eat there? No, they were in the nineties. It, it was it was like Boston Market chicken. It was good. Anyway, sad. Um, but in this third jurisdiction, basically the wife, even if she's a gambler, will not be able to any, uh, they, they can't seize the husband's interest. So uh, group three, if you want to think about it, is basically Mississippi in the 1830s, right? One spouse cannot acquire a debt for the other spouse. Okay, so uh, Victor, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Kinza, now you're up. Can I ask you a question, please? Mm-hmm. Pour one out. Right. Uh, Poor enough for Kenny. Um, So, Kinsa, let me ask you a question. Under this third approach, right, how can you ever recover against a married tortfeasor? I guess if both parties consent to... Ah, but consent to what, right? The husband slammed his car into the plaintiffs. Right. How, in the case of a tort, how can there ever be consent? Well, I guess if both parties were in the car, but also no, I but, feel no, like... No, come on, come on. You know, you know torts. Yeah. If you're the passenger in a car, are you responsible for the accident? I mean, maybe you, like you threw hot water at it or something, right? But as a general matter, if you're the passenger, are you liable for any torts? No. So, so, so in, a, in the case of a tort, Kinza... How can you ever go after? The, how can you ever seize the, the homestead in this in, in Hawaii? Can I you feel ever? like he just has to ask his wife and be like, "Can I give?" Yeah. Okay. What well, wife is gonna say? Sure, honey, give away our house. That, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Not gonna happen, is it? Probably not. No. So thank thank you, Kinza. The upshot of the majority opinion here, right? The the the, the, the impact of the majority opinion here is that community property safe. Right. I'm sorry. Is, is that the, the homestead is safe, right? That the courts are not going to allow the husband's debts to result in a foreclosure of the homestead, right? The husband's debts, it's not going to matter. We'll come back to number four in, in a few minutes. I want to jump to the dissent. Uh, Elisa, you here? You here, Elisa? No, I mean, I think you need a more recent role. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, ah, Chance, you're up next. Hello. 
Your chance? Here we go, here we go. Okay. There here we go. go. Now we're in business. Okay, chance. Tell me what the dissent said. It was a brief dissent, but uh, the dissent was not happy with the majority's approach. You want a direct quote or? What did the dissent say, Chance? Basically, that that wasn't right. That uh, what? Should, what's that? That what? what what's that? Was that, that the uh, the majority view isn't applicable? There is the, you, you alienate her right of survivorship, and it follows that if the wife takes equal rights to the husband in the estate. She must take equal disability. Yes. Okay. I want to focus on that. What does that mean, Chance? Right? The wife takes equal rights, and she takes equal disabilities. What does that phrase mean? It's a very important phrase we just said. The analogy I think of is like responding as superior when you get into that, you're part of a corporation and then you now have equal liability for the acts of the corporation. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it, right? If women want to be equal, right? Thank you, Chance. If women want to be equal, they have to take the good with the bad. That is, they can alienate their own property, but they're also liable for their own debts. And the dissent would adopt the New Jersey approach, which says is truly equal, right? You know, I'll give you an example from a case we'll study in common law later, constitutional law next semester. Um, Oklahoma had a law that said if you were a guy, you could buy beer at 21. But if you were a girl, you could buy beer at 19. Why? They thought girls were more responsible than boys, right? True or not, I'll let you guys argue. It's not, not for me to decide. <laughs> Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. It's gender discrimination. So what happens? Could the boys buy beer at 19? No, everyone buys beer at 21, right? You either level up or level down. So if you get more rights, you get more responsibilities. And that's how things often go in the law. It sucks, I know. Uh, but the girls have to wait to be 21. Pour one out indeed. Um, questions on the uh, approach number three either in New Jersey, I'm sorry, or, or the, the, the third grouping of approaches. Okay. Now, the court discusses, is this unfair to creditors? And I, I'm somewhat skeptical of this. Um, you know, if, if you're giving a mortgage to a married person, you can get them to sign both the husband and wife. But in the case of a tort, there's no way for the wife to consent. And I don't think that um, it's even feasible to attach it. Now, the court also discusses family solidarity, right? Uh, uh, Blake, what's this family solidarity business? This is a theme we'll be talking about a lot. Uh, I think you're still on mute, sir. Can you hear me now? Yeah, loud and clear. What's this family solidarity business? <laughs> Is this still part of the dissenters? Is this back up in the main? Oh case? no, we're back back in the majority. Oh, there it is. Uh, it's where you retain some influence upon the situation or uh, upon the institution. Uh, it's only available to the husband and wife. Uh, well, well, what does family solidarity? What does solidarity mean in general? Uh, standing alone, or well, in this case, as a family unit itself. No, no, no. That's solitary. This is solidarity. It's a different word. I would say it's a strength yes. type of word. Yeah, no, it's true. Solidarity. Uh, solidarity means when you come together, right? One of the common themes in this topic is keeping the household, keeping the homestead together. The courts do not like taking away the homestead of married property. And in fact, a lot of restrictions on when you can seize it in bankruptcy and other types of proceedings. So I think what's motivating the court here is a desire to keep families together and not let the family homestead be taken because the husband's a bad driver. I think that's what, what, what's sort of motivating here. Okay. Any questions so far? Um, don't worry too much about approach number four. Um, approach number four is basically you can sell your survivorship rights, um, uh, but you can't sell it during life. Not very important, so don't kill yourself for number four. But you should know at least the difference between two and three. One is basically a nullity. Don't worry about four. So really, two and three are the ones you should know about. If I had to describe three, that's like the common law rule. If I describe two, that's sort of the modern approach. I mean, that's not like a hard and fast rule, but I would, I would, I think I would, for your notes, at least draw the line. 
Two is more of the modern approach. Three is more of the common law approach. I think you could keep in your notes separate like that. It might make it a little bit, a little bit easier. Okay. Questions on the Sawada case? It's a good case. Okay. Um, there are a few notes um, after the case. Um, this is a topic that has a lot of overlap with constitutional law. Um, in the 1970s, the Supreme Court decided cases that held uh, that gender discrimination is, office, is often unconstitutional. Uh, that gender discrimination is often unconstitutional. Um, so at least in the three states in the first category, uh, those are gone. Okay. Um, but as a practical matter today, the tenancy by entirety exists mostly to shield people from debt. That's one of the only things it does. It doesn't have much use elsewhere. Um, I've described so far state law. Um, federal law is different. Um, if you fail to pay your taxes, let's say a husband fails to pay his taxes, the IRS, our good friends of the federal government, can seize the homestead even if if it's tenancy by the entirety. So under federal law, you're not shielded if one spouse fails to pay his taxes. Um, bankruptcy is a little bit different. Um, if, if one spouse declares bankruptcy, the creditors cannot seize the, um, uh, the what do you call it, the, uh, the homestead. So the, the rules are a little bit different. Okay, questions? All right, let me, let me summarize a bit and I'll get you out of here on time. Oh, office hours. Does anyone want to either by chat or raise your hand of how I should do office hours? I, I don't know the right answer here. I want to do whatever works best for you. I don't, I don't have a strong opinion. I want to be as flexible as I can. So you want to raise your hand or maybe tell me how your other professors are doing it or, or what you think might work better? Anyone? Please. Okay, uh, Jenny has raised her hand. Okay, Jenny, what do you think? Um, our our LAW professor is essentially going to hold uh, meetings via Zoom and keep uh, the majority of participants in a waiting room, she called it, and yeah. just call students into the meeting one by one. I can do that, right? I, that's actually easy. Uh, uh, so thanks, Jenny. Okay. Um, uh, let me put you back in mute. So... Uh, the way the way you when you clicked on my link today, you're probably in a waiting room for a few minutes, and that was deliberate. Um, I don't want people in there unless I'm there because you might do stupid things uh, or say stupid things. Just everyone, just be nice. Um, so I could do the office hours by letting people in one at a time, and I think that that actually works well. And I could just do it based on the order in which you join, and you'll basically wait in the waiting room the same way you would wait in my hallway outside my office. Um, Chance, I think your hand was up before. It's not up right now. All right. I see. Appointment only. Appointments are tricky. I, I, I want more fluid, but if you want to email me, be happy to set up a time. Private Zooms. Uh, I agree with Doug. What are your hours again? What are my hours? My hours are whenever. I don't I don't have a schedule anymore. My life is now with you. Uh, I, I think my app, I'll, I'll start at 3.30 today. So if you want to um, uh, talk to me today, just st stay here for a few minutes afterwards, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll turn my camera on in a few minutes. I'll go to the bathroom, uh, but my hours will be right after this one, and uh, I'll get some water. Okay. All right. Anyone else want to raise your hand? I'll do that then after class, starting at three thirty today. Um, yeah, uh, waiting room today. Just be there at three thirty. In fact, you don't even have to disconnect. Just leave your camera on. And I'll just come back and I'll, I'll put you in one at a time to a room, okay? We also have what are called breakout rooms, um, where I can basically assign you to a private room. So there are different ways of managing this. Okay, anything else? All right, let me let me summarize a bit, and I'll do the office hours in, at 3.30 in about 10 minutes. I'm so run around for a bit. Um, don't forget our three types of co-tenancies. There's the tenancy in common the joint tenancy and the tenancy by the entirety. Um, with the tenancy in common, there's no survivorship. If A dies, it goes to A's heirs. 
Uh, with joint tenancy, you do have survivorship, right? You have uh, uh, A dies, it goes to B. Uh, the tenancy by the entirety is similar, but you have this additional unity of marriage. Uh, but the key important factor to keep in mind is that the tenancy by the entirety, one spouse cannot sever the unities. They both have to turn the key. Um, it gets tricky with debt, though, because if one spouse acquires debt, there are circumstances where the creditor can go after the homestead. Um, in Category 2, the modern approach, the New Jersey approach, uh, the creditors can seize the husband's assets. In Jurisdiction 3, the, the common law approach, the creditors cannot seize the spouse's assets and the tenancy by the entirety. I think that's it. More or less on time. All right. Anyone, any questions, things in your mind? All right. You guys, if you want to talk to me, just hang here. Or actually, um, you know what? Let's just make this easier So because the, 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 the university is recording these. You can just all click end meeting and just come back in 10 minutes and I'll let you in one at a time, okay? Sound good? Give me a thumbs up if it, if it works. Clap, thumbs up. I am happy to see that. Okay, yes, very good. Thank you. All right, so uh, come back in about 10 minutes and I'll let you in one at a time. Thank you.